Hello, and welcome to a brand new day of free-to-play here on Magic the Gathering Arena. Get the dish on the latest with me, Lord Rumfish, and the latest is definitely here. Wizards of the Coast has officially announced Fallen Empires Remastered will be coming to MTG Arena. The entire 102-card set, along with all of the booster fun treatment of the alternative art and flavor text on the commons, will all be arriving on Arena. Furthermore, Fallen Empires is going to be part of not only formats like Timeless and Historic, it is also going to be part of Standard. So the implications for this are enormous, and uh, there are a bunch of new cards and mechanics to go over. It's even going to have its own limited format, which is probably going to be a little degenerate um, since it's a small set, and you're going to see a whole lot of repeat cards. But I'm going to cover it all here anyway uh, for your benefit. So I'm going to do a rules primer here in this video so that you don't trip up on some of the new mechanics that you're going to come across in Fallen Empires. So there's a sub-theme in this set of creatures that can attack, and if they are not blocked, then something special can occur, um, which is a May ability. Uh, you don't have to do so. Uh, an example of this is Feral's Mantle. You can put it on any creature. It's an aura. And when that creature attacks and is not blocked, you may have a deal damage equal to its power plus two to another target creature. Um, so this is kind of like a green bite spell in a way. It's just that the attacking creature needs to get through without being blocked. Uh, if you choose to do this, the attacking creature assigns no combat damage this turn. Um, so all of these cards that have this effect in Fallen Empires have the trade-off that they don't deal their normal combat damage, um, instead doing their special effect. Banding is another uh, old ability in Magic, which has not seen print in a long time. Um, as you can see on this Icacian Infantry, it's a human soldier. Um, you can look over at the Oracle text here. It can gain First Strike, it can also gain Banding. So, Banding has different uses, whether it's offensively or defensively. So any creatures with banding and up to one without, so one creature without banding can always join in a band, can attack. Um, they're treated as a group, right? Um, it is blocked as a group. So a single creature can block the entire attacking band, potentially. If any creatures with banding you control are blocking or being blocked by a creature, you divide the creature's combat damage, not its controller, among any of the creatures it's being blocked by or is blocking. So, in an attacking band, any number of banding creatures and one that doesn't can attack together. They are blocked as if they were a single creature, but you get to distribute where the... Uh, damage is assigned. So for example, if you have creatures with first strike in your band, you can have them apply their damage to the opposing creatures first, maybe kill some of the creatures blocking, and then if you have other special damage abilities like trample, you can apply those later, and you can apply all of that to the opponent. Uh, when you are blocking, uh, banding is even stronger. So uh, you might notice that it says if any creatures with banding you control are blocking a creature. So it just takes one creature with banding um, when you block a creature. Then you assign that creature's combat damage. So it only takes one banding creature on a block. So then you get to assign, you know, the order of the blockers, how the damage... Um, is assigned from there. You could have all of, you know, a giant creature's damage go to a 1-1. One, one. And I think uh, since banding was created under the old rules for combat, you may still be able to distribute um, a large amount of damage among different creatures and have them all survive. Right? If you had one with four toughness, one with three toughness, you a creature that had five power, you could assign three of it to the four toughness creature, two of it to the three toughness creature, they would just survive. Um, 
and potentially kill that attacker without suffering any losses. So banding is a potent offensive ability. It's an even more potent defensive ability. Protection is an ability that we don't see very often anymore in Magic. It does come up from time to time. So the easiest way to remember what protection does is uh, D-E-B-T, debt. And what it stands for is damage, right? It cannot be damaged by something it has protection from. It cannot be enchanted or equipped by something it has protection from. So, right, you can't put a white aura onto this creature, and if it gained protection, it would fall off. Um, I think that means in general that things can't attach to it if they have the quality. Um, it cannot be blocked by creatures of that color, uh, which matters a lot with multicolor cards. Um, increases the odds it's going to have protection from it. And targeted. It can't be targeted by something of that quality. So this one can't be targeted by white things. Um, and that's it. It's not an end-all be-all. It doesn't save you from a board sweeper like Wrath of God. Um, but it is an incredibly useful and frustrating ability. Um, it can be incredibly defensive. And, you know, if the opponent has creatures of that color, it can be offensive as well. They can't block you. Shroud is an interesting uh, throwback ability here. We don't hardly see it anymore on modern cards. They don't even do hexproof much anymore, but Shroud is even more rare. Um, so Shroud simply means that it can't be the target of spells or abilities, and that includes the controller. It means once you have given this creature Shroud, you can't target it either. Now, since this one doesn't start with Shroud, that means that you can do something like attach equipment to it, put an aura on it, later give it Shroud, and that doesn't cause it to fall off like protection. Um, it just protects it later. Uh, Shroud is a defensive ability, has no offensive application. Um, the only things in, that, in the set with Shroud uh, get it as an activated ability. Landwalk abilities... Um, or something they have not been printing as much recently. So River Merfolk can gain Mountain Walk, and that means it can't be blocked as long as the defending player controls a mountain. There are different kinds of Land Walk. There's been non-basic Land Walk in the past. Um, it just simply means that the creature can't be blocked if the defending player has a land that meets the, uh, the right qualities. Regeneration. Uh, so when you sacrifice this aura it regenerates the enchanted creature. What that means, uh, we haven't seen a lot of regeneration lately in Magic, is it puts a regeneration shield on the creature, which protects it against a future instance of taking lethal damage or being destroyed. Um, and when it regenerates, you tap the creature, you remove it from combat, and you remove all damage from it. Um, it prevents uh, the destroy effect. Coin flipping is pretty straightforward. Um, so in this case, you pay a red, a target creature you control with toughness two or less gains flying until end of turn. Then you flip a coin beginning of the next end step. If you lose the flip, sacrifice that creature. So uh, there'll be some mechanic in the client where you just pick heads or tails. It'll flip a coin for you. You got basically a 50-50 shot of whether or not you sacrifice the creature. Um, coin flip cards are pretty easy to implement. There are two artifacts in the set that act as precursors to modern equipment. So they do not work the same way. Um, you play this artifact at any time at instant speed. You can pay three and tap and give a creature plus two plus zero oh as long as this remains tapped. Then you may choose not to untap this during your untap step which is, you know, delivering the flavor of the creature staying equipped with the weapon. So um, it's quite a bit different than a modern piece of equipment, uh, which moves around at sorcery speed, but you don't have to tap it in order to use its ability, and so it's easy to move it again. Um, 
after a creature's already uh, started wearing it. In this implementation, it acts a little bit as a combat trick. There are many different kinds of counters on the cards of Fallen Empires. Um, it could go pretty well with Proliferate um, in our standard environment. Uh, Ication Javelineers gets a Javelin counter. It can remove a Javelin counter to deal one damage to any target. So this can ping any target. If you could proliferate up the Javelin counter, you'd have a very nasty creature on your hands. Ication Money Changer uses credit counters. So the idea with this card is that you initially take three damage um, as you're putting away money as a long-term investment. And then this card starts with three credit counters, adds another on the upkeep. Eventually you sacrifice it and gain one life for each credit counter that's on it. You can only do this during your upkeep. So this is another type of counter to be aware of. So Homerids and one other card in the set use Tide counters. Um, both of the cards follow the same pattern. Uh, so let's go over it. This card enters the battlefield with one tide counter on it. At the beginning of your upkeep, you put another tide counter on it. If there's exactly one tide counter on this, it gets minus one, minus one. If there are exactly three tide counters on it, it gets plus one, plus one. And when it gets to four or more tide counters on it, you remove all the tide counters. And this means it follows the pattern of when it has no tide counters, or two tide counters, it's neither smaller or bigger. When it has one tide counter or three tide counters, it changes size. So uh, this has the flavor of, uh, you know, ebbing with the flows of the tide of the sea. It's a very flavorful card. Final Influence is the other card that follows this pattern with tide counters. Um, this one, you can only cast it if there are no other permanents named Tidal Influence on the battlefield. So it enters with one Tide Counter. At the beginning of your upkeep, you add a Tide Counter. And when it gets to four or more Tide Counters, you remove them all. It follows the same pattern. If there's exactly one Tide Counter on this, blue creatures get minus two power. If there are exactly three Tide Counters on it, blue creatures get plus two power. And this is a symmetrical effect. It affects both you and the opponent. Mercene is um, one of your typical blue uh, lockdown enchantments. This one uses net counters. So it comes in with three net counters. The enchanted creature doesn't untap if it has any net counters on it. And the controller of the enchanted creature may pay the enchanted creature's mana cost to remove a net counter from Mercene. So they can eventually pay their way out from under this enchantment. Um, it just locks down the creature until they're able to pay the tax. There are different kinds of power toughness counters uh, spread across Fallen Empires. Um, in modern sets, we're used to seeing plus one, plus one counters, maybe occasionally minus one, minus one counters. Um, but these are not those counters, and they do not interact with those counters. Um, they have their own separate treatment. They're their own particular type of counter on a creature. So when you sacrifice Armor Thrall, you can put a plus one, plus two counter on a creature. And that would proliferate and be treated separately from the other types of counters that are on the creature. Evan Praetor uses minus two, minus two counters, and also plus one, plus zero counters, um, both on the same card. So... It builds up minus two, minus two counters, but you can sacrifice creatures uh, on your upkeep once each turn to remove the counter. If it's a thrall, it gets a plus one power counter. Also, this uh, art seems to feature a bunny rabbit um, that's helping to sacrifice a merfolk to the Ebon Praetor. Soul Exchange can put a plus two, plus two counter on a creature uh, it requires you to exile a creature you control. Um, you return a creature card from your graveyard to the battlefield. And if the exiled card was a thrall, sorry, if the exiled creature was a thrall, then the one you bring back gets a plus two, plus two counter. 
There are a couple of cards that use minus one, minus one counters. Um, these are directly canceled out by plus one, plus one counters. If they would both appear on the same card, um, they destroy one another. Right, so they just cancel out and try to return the card back towards no counters. Torox's Gate uses time counters. Now technically, you can use Torox's Gate without ever getting the time counters on it. The turn that you play it, um, you know, you enchant a land, you can tap the enchanted land, you give attacking creatures you control plus two, minus one. Watch out for that minus one. <laughs> Make sure you have enough toughness until end of turn. And you can only do this if the enchanted land is untapped. So you can keep this thing around by removing a time counter at the beginning of your upkeep. And the only way to get time counters on it is to sacrifice a thrall. And that puts three time counters on this. So in a thrall deck, you could keep this team pump effect around. Um, one thrall keeps this around for an extra three turns. Hopefully the turn that you're playing this, you might be able to attack for the win. If you can't, maybe you've got a uh, you know, breeding pit and you're producing a thrall every turn, which means you can keep this thing around indefinitely and attack at some future point. Um, the card's pretty awful, <laughs> but it uses time counters. Warven Armorer is able to put plus one toughness counters or plus one power counters on target creature. And again, these are treated separately from other types of counters. You proliferate them and all of that separately. There is a big theme of spore counters in this set. Most of them appear on Thalids. Um, this one happens to be an elf, but most of the uh, spore counter creatures are Thalids. They're a uh, fungus type creature, I believe. Uh, a lot of them, you can remove three spore counters to create a one on green sap rolling creature token. Some of them have other abilities, like dealing one damage to any target, or preventing all combat damage, or regenerating uh, the Thalid that they're on. Uh, the Elvish Farmer can also sacrifice Saprolings to gain two life. Um, you gain them on the upkeep. All of the cards in this set, I believe, care about removing three of them. Three is the magic number. Those of you who've been playing Magic for a while might remember some variations on the storage counter lands. Uh, if you haven't had the pleasure, these are the originals. So they enter the battlefield tapped. You can choose not to untap them on your untap step. And on your upkeep, if it is tapped, it gains a storage counter. So you have a choice of whether you want to get access to the mana or you want to continue to build the mana up. It's a neat tension that's built into these cards. You can tap and remove any number of storage counters from it. And for the bottomless vault, you add black for each storage counter removed. Uh, this is a cycle. There is one for every color. And um, obviously proliferate could make these much stronger than normal. Um, so I'm interested to see what we can do with these in standard. Delph's cube gains cube counters the way that it does so is you have to pay to and tap, and when a target creature you control attacks and is not blocked, it assigns no combat damage this turn and it gains a cube counter. So you have to stop an unblocked creature from being able to assign combat damage. Um, it's worth noting that it didn't have to have any combat damage it could deal, so you could take an ornithopter um, and prevent its combat damage to gain a cube counter. And you can remove the cube counters from Delph's cube to regenerate a creature. Um, so again, regenerating something um, removes it from combat, um, prevents a destroy effect, takes damage off of it, uh, taps it. This card has always been a conundrum to me because it's always felt like you're actively stopping yourself from winning the game in the process of using it. Um, I'm curious to see if anyone comes up with a clever use for why you need to regenerate creatures so badly. That's it for the rules primer. I am so excited uh, that this set is coming to Arena, that we're gonna be able to draft with it, that we're gonna get access to it in standard. It's gonna be amazing. Um, so I'm gonna be putting out a top 10 video 
of the uh, top 10 cards that are going to impact standard. And then I'm going to do a full uh, limited set review for Fallen Empires. So stay tuned. Um, check out all the videos on the channel. Um, you can like and subscribe. That helps out too. And until next time, never stop honing your critical thinking and empathy on this day of April 1st.